Good morning, this is Ms. Billerbeck and we're going to talk about the first lesson in Algebra 1, 1.1 Operations on Real Numbers. So first let's get some vocabulary down. So when we're talking about set, a set is a collection of objects such that as numbers, utensils, dolls, video games, etc. So when we write a set, we usually put little curly brackets um, to denote a set. So an element of a set is an object that is in the set. So this little epsilon here denotes element. So if you ever see that in math literature, that's shorthand for this word element. So if I have set A equals marmots, chipmunks, grouse, and bears, the name of the set is A, and the elements of the set are marmots, chipmunks, grouse, and bears. So the number of elements of a set is denoted as lowercase n and then parentheses A, capital A, in parentheses. And if we want to say something is not an element of a set, I can write it like this. Cat is not an element of set A. All right, so let's talk about subset. So if each element of a set B is also an element of set A, then B is a subset of A. So we'd write B is a subset of A. So if B does not equal A, B is a proper sunset, subset, not sunset. <laughs> we, we like our sunsets, but we're talking about subsets now. So if B is a proper subset, then instead of writing the equal bar right here for that symbol, then we're going to write B is a proper subset of A. So math can be very confusing because we have a lot of symbols and the symbols mean a lot. So if B equals A, then we go back to the symbol with the equal sign. Then set B is a subset of A and also A is a subset of B because they are both equal sets. Like if this one was one, two, three, four, if B was one, two, three, four, A was one, two, three, four. So they have the same elements in each set. So we can reverse that they're subsets of each other. So that's only when B equals A, set B equals set A. But we can say, um, in this case, A is not a proper subset of B, because in order to have a proper subset, B set B cannot equal set A. Okay, so then we use this one here without the equal sign to show a proper subset. Okay. All right, we also have universal sets. So a universal set, the overall set to which all other sets are a subset. So we use this word, this uh, Greek letter here, psi. I hope I'm saying that right, psi, okay? So I don't use this letter very often and it's very hard to write. So, um, but that is the um, symbol for universal set. Okay, so an empty set, or you might hear null set, is a set that belongs to all sets. So we use this for null set, okay? So, um, so basically the universal set is like the overarching set, like real numbers. 
real numbers hold um, rational numbers, irrational numbers, whole numbers, natural or counting numbers, and integers. Okay, so real numbers is the universal set. An empty set for that is no numbers at all. Okay, not even zero, because <laughs> zero actually belongs to whole numbers and integers. So a null set would have no set, no numbers at all. Okay, this symbol here in math was used to say therefore, given set A, for any set A, we can write the null set is less than or equal to set A, which is less than or equal to the universal set. Okay, so the empty set is less than or equal to A, which is less than or equal to the universal set. Okay, our last bit of vocabulary is complement. So if set B is a subset of set A, then all the elements of set A not in set B are the complement of set B, and we write B with a little prime mark here. Okay, so let's look at this really quickly. So if B is, set B is one, two, three, four, and set A is one, two, three, I'm sorry, if B is set one, two, three, and A is set one, two, three, four, then B, the complement of B, B prime, is four, because if we look at the set B, it doesn't have four in it. Okay, A has four in it, so four is the complement of B. Okay. All right, let's do a few problems now. So given set A is 0, 1, 2, 3, B is 0, 1, 2, and C is 1, 2, we want to write a relationship. Okay, so we have A is bigger than B. So we can write B is not a, A is not a subset of B because A is bigger than B, it's not a subset. But B, which is smaller than A, not including all the elements, is a proper sunset, sunset again. Huh, I just wanna watch a sunset. Um, B is a subset of A. Okay, but we see that set B and set C is zero, one, two, three. I'm sorry, zero, one, two and they both are zero, one, two. So they're equal. So we can write this. Okay, and if they're equal, I can switch set C and set B and it's not a problem. So in regards to set A, so if we look back to set A, zero, one, two, three, and we want to write the complement of B. Well, B is 0, 1, 2, but it does not include that 3. Then the complement of B is 3. All right. OK, so then our example 2 is we're going to compare and order numbers. So if we have 0.25 uh, there and the square root, we look at the square root of one squared, three squared, that's one third, which is 0.3 bar. And then we have six over 2.5 or 25. Well, this one equals 0.254. Okay, so how we could figure that one out is um, if this was 6 over 24, that'd be 1 fourth, which is 0.25. Okay, so we know it's a little different than 6 over 24. 
and it's dividing in smaller um, parts uh, because now instead of 24 parts, we're going to cut the cake into 25 parts, meaning the slivers of cake are going to be smaller. So, so that means this number is going to be smaller than that number. This is bigger than both of them. So if we were to order this, we would put the 0.24 down here. Oops, I guess I should write that as it appears in the list, not what it appears as I know as a decimal. So I'd write six over 25 right there. Then I'd write 0 0.25 right here. And then way over here, I'd write point, uh, well, the square root of one over nine. Okay. Now, if I look at 11 25ths, okay, so we see 11 25ths. I'm sorry, 121, which is 11 squared over 5 squared. Okay, so we want to, that's going to be 11 over 5, which is 2 and 1 fifth, which is 2.2. .2. Okay, so we should know our 1 fifths um, and how they convert to a decimal. So 2 fifths is 0 0.4, 3 fifths is 0 0.6, 4 fifths is 0 0.8, 5 fifths is 100. Okay, so we have 2.2 for this one, and then this is 2.25, and then we have the square root of 5, which that one's a little hard. So if you, you can estimate it, it's going to be a little bigger than 2 because square root of 4 is 2. But because we're really close in here to 2.2, we probably want to use a calculator on that one. Um, so just to make sure, we're doing it right. Okay, so, whoops. Okay, so when we do that on a calculator, and good thing we did. So that, that is 2.236 when we do it on a calculator. So now we can order these. Okay, so we have um, the square root of 121 over 25 is the smallest. And then this one's, this one is smaller than that one. So we're going to put the square root of 25 here. And then we have um, 2.25. Okay, so that's, that was a little smaller than the five. Okay. All right, so let's talk about something that's a little bit uh, abstract. Okay, so let's talk about operations with rational numbers. So is the sum of two rational numbers always rational? Well, the definition of a rational number is that it can be written as a fraction, two integers written as a fraction. Okay, so if we have one number, so let's say one number is x, that's a over b, and one number is y. And we're going to say this for all our cases is b over c. Oops, not b over c, we want c over d. c over d. Okay, so is the sum of the two rational numbers always rational? Well, let's look. So we have a over b plus c over d, and then we have to get a common denominator, so we're going to multiply by d over d here and b over b here. Okay, and these a and b and c and d, these are all integers, remember? Integers are the negative numbers, negative counting numbers to zero to positive counting numbers. Okay, so this gives us a D plus B C over B D. 
because they both have a BD on the bottom, so we can put them like that. So if we multiply two integers together, we know we get integers. Okay, since these are both integers, I have an integer here plus an integer here divided by an integer here. Now, as long as um, B does not equal zero and D does not equal zero, and we have to say that up front when we make these fractions here, that B can't equal zero and D can't equal zero because then we would have an undefined situation. You can't have zero in the denominator. So as long as that condition um, happens, this is a rational answer because we have two integers multiplying here plus two integers multiplying here. Now remember, integers can be negative or positive. So that could be very similar to taking the difference of two integers. So in this case, we've also proven um, the difference of two rational numbers always is rational, okay? Let's look at the product. Now, if we continue with this definition of X and Y, the product of two rational numbers. So we have AB times CD. So that just becomes AC over BD. Now, again, as long as B doesn't equal zero and D doesn't equal zero, then this is the product of two rational, two integers is an integer. Okay, so we have an integer of an integer, which by definition is a rational number. Okay, but now let's look at this one. Okay, this one says that, um, it says if the quotient of two rational, the quotient of two rational, is the quotient of two rational numbers always rational? Let's get some work and take a look. So we've said B and D can't equal zero. Okay, that's um, because when we set it up in the first way, we can't have a zero in the denominator because that creates an undefined situation. Okay, so we always have to say those two can't be zero. So let's look at the, if we take the quotient of the two numbers. So we're going to keep change flip. So that becomes A over B times D over C equals AD over BC. Now the definition of an integer, which all of these are integers, is that it is negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, and it keeps going. So what problem do we have with this when we set it up like this? Well, we know B can't equal zero and D can't equal zero from how we started. But what do we need to say also has to be zero now in order for this to not be undefined? Okay, if you said, well, now C's on the bottom, that's kind of a problem. It's a denomin it's in the denominator. So C cannot be equal to zero. So if we specify that C can't equal zero, then we have a rational situation. Okay, if we do not specify that, if C equals zero, then we have an undefined situation because we have zero in the denominator. Okay, so it could be rational as long as he doesn't equal zero. All right, so let's look on at the next one. All right, so operations with rational and irrational numbers. Now, 
It says, is the sum of a rational number and an irrational number rational or irrational? So if we say again that x equals a over b and y is c, which is irrational. Okay, so we and we let's just say, um, actually, let's not say that C is irrational, and then Y equals D over E, okay, which is two integers, okay. So if I have A over B, plus C, we want to know, does it equal D over E, a rational number? Okay, so let's use an additive inverse and move this over to the other side. So we end up C equals D over E plus, oops, no, it's a minus, minus A over B, but we have to get a common uh, denominator here. So we're gonna multiply by B over B here, and we're gonna multiply by E over E here. So our C then equals BD minus AE over E. E. Okay, now if we remember that B, D, A, E, um, all of these are integers, okay? And we do have to say a few things that B can't equal zero and E can't equal zero. Okay, that's important. So if we look at this situation, um, and we have the product of two integers, which is an integer. And then we have this, we know that the difference of two integers is also rational because we can, the sum of two integers is rational and integers could be negative and plus, minus, plus a negative number is very similar to subtraction. So the difference of two integers um, is still an integer and then um, then it's divided by an integer, or we um, we could have a fraction of an integer over an integer, which is, again, the definition of rational. So in this situation, they would be rational. Okay, so we cannot have an irrational, the sum of, so if, this is rational, but this one is irrational. That just cannot happen. Okay, so we defined C as irrational, but we know that this side has to be rational. So an irrational number, the sum of a rational number, an irrational number is irrational. Okay, what about the product of these? So if we look at A over B again and multiply it by C, okay, so we, we end up having the same situation. So we have um, AC over B. Okay, so A times a rational number times an irrational number would just be um, irrational still. So, oh, well, we can do it this way, sorry. So we can say, is the product of these equal to um, DE? There we go, that's how you, we would prove it. So we wanna know what is DE? Is it going to be rational or irrational? So then what we can do is, isolate C again like we did over here. So in that case, we're going to divide both sides by AB.
And so we have C equals DE divided by A over B. So we keep change flip. We have DE times B over A, which is BD over AE. Now we define these as integers again. So we already know that the product of two integers is rational. So we have a rational number here, a rational number here. So um, a rational number can be written with two integers. This is an this is an integer here because the product of two integers is an integer and the product of two integers is an integer. So the definition of a rational number is that you have an integer of, divided by an integer or it can re, be written as a fraction. So this means this is rational and this is irrational. And so this is irrational, this is rational. So an irrational number cannot equal a rational number. So we again have a situation where the product of a rational number and an irrational number um, cannot be um, a rational number. So the product of a rational number and irrational number is irrational. All right, that's it for this lesson. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.